Hi everyone, my name is Lily and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Great Smokies Writing Program and welcome to the final session of Writers at Home for Spring 2021. Thank you all for joining us today as we celebrate the spring issue of our program publication, The Great Smokies Review. It's always a great way to wrap up the semester by hearing some of the amazing work generated in our classes. And as always, we are incredibly grateful to Malaprops for giving us this virtual space and we are especially thankful that the support will continue into the fall. Um, before we get started, uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, the first is that there's still space available in three of our summer workshops, and those are Writing for Change with Carolina Silicio Perez, Intro to Feature Writing with Mark McNamara, and Writing for Young Adults with Joy Eves. Um, these are three incredible opportunities, and since they're offered via Zoom, they're open to writers across the state and beyond. So if you have friends who live outside of Asheville but have wanted to take one of our classes, now is the time. Um, our classes start in June, so don't wait to sign up. Of course, descriptions and registration information is on our website, and that is greatsmokies.unca.edu. The second announcement is that there are five seats remaining in our Young Writers Workshop in July. Uh, we are so grateful to have Eric Steiniger and Jameson Ridenauer back to teach for us. They always run an amazing program. Um, if you have or know a high school writer looking to write this summer, especially if they're interested in poetry um, or podcasting, please encourage them to check it out and apply on our website. And again, that is greatsmokies.unca.edu. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Lutchens, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Great Smokies Review. Elizabeth is also the instructor for our prose masterclass, which she has led for 12 years. Um, she's a former journalist, a graduate of the MFA program at Warren Wilson College, and in her spare time, she is currently working on a historical fiction novel. I've said it before, but we are incredibly lucky to have Elizabeth with the program and with the review and here with us today to introduce our readers. So Elizabeth, I will pass the mic to you. Thanks, Lily. I just like to echo what Lily said about um, appreciating the role Malaplot Malaprops has played over the years in the Great Smokies writing program. I speak for myself and the rest of our editorial team, Julie Abbott, happy birthday, Julie, Janet Moore, and our UNC Asheville intern, Eliana Franklin. During the pandemic, Malaprops staff kept the doors open virtually for us to share our publication with the reading and writing community of Asheville, North Carolina. And thanks to Zoom, with anybody just about anywhere. So reading today are representatives of writers whose work appears in the spring issue of the Great Smokies Review, our 24th issue. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about them before we, we actually hear their readings. Josh Baru, a physician in Asheville, specializes in palliative care. He lives with his wife, three boys, three lizards, a snake, four fish, a snail, and the meat rabbit that showed up on their doorstep one day. Dana Lichty wrote thousands of proposals and reports throughout her career as a consultant for New York City nonprofits. After moving to Asheville in 2011, she signed up for her first Great Smokies writing course, mistakenly thinking it was on prose, not poetry. She's grateful for the confusion and is now at work on a series of poems about the Iowa she knew as a child. Emma Castleberry is a writer who calls Asheville home, though she's often found sleeping on the ground or in her car in pursuit of all things wild and free. She is the associate editor of the Laurel of Asheville magazine. And she also enjoys reporting on social justice and the outdoors. Daryl Dahl is a ghost writer and business journalist whose work has appeared in a diverse range of publications, including the New York Times, Forbes, Inc., Men's Journal, and Blue Ridge Outdoors. He's also ghostwritten 18 books, several of which have landed on bestseller lists. Nicole Farmer dreamed of flying as a child, which led her to run away from home at the age of seven to join the circus as a trapeze artist. They kindly returned her to her home before nightfall. Nicole is a reading tutor and nature lover who has found her home in the Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina. Janet Smithmore was a finalist in North Carolina State University's 2020 short story competition and placed third in Ireland's 2018 fish short story competition. Most recently, she co-authored In Pursuit of a Greater Good, a history of Western North Carolina communities and its work in rural education, oh, sorry, economic development. As our guest editor, 
Janet selected a poem and a short story from this issue to highlight in her essay in praise of shared history. She'll introduce these two authors and their readings, which will conclude today's program. Carson Menno is a journalist, writer, and filmmaker who splits time between Asheville and Washington, DC. Priscilla Frake is the author of Correspondence, a book of epistolary poems. She has work in Verse Daily, Nimrod, The Midwest Quarterly, Medical Literary Messenger, Carbon Culture Review, Spoon River Poetry Review, and the New Welsh Review, among others. Her honors include the Laureen Pounsey Award at the Houston Poetry Festival and a Pushcart Cart nomination. She is a studio jeweler in Asheville. We'll begin with Josh Baru reading a work of creative nonfiction. Josh. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'll be reading two sections from my piece, Blessed. My grandpa Stanley was born in 1908 in the region of Russia that would become the Ukraine. When he was six, Russia entered the First World War. His little town would have been emptied of men until it fell behind the German front in 1918. His dad, in fact, was one of the five million men that served in the Russian army and one of the two million that died. He was shot in the leg. The skin around that wound became tense, shiny, and sunburn red. Days later, rose-colored tendrils streamed up from that pocket of pus, carrying bacteria into his bloodstream. Shock ensued, followed quickly by death. After my great-grandfather's death, when my grandpa was 10 years old, the same age as my son's right now, his mother sent him to live with his aunt and uncle. His aunt and uncle were deeply religious, and the plan was for him to travel with them to Palestine and become a rabbi. They fled with the retreating German army. In Warsaw, they waited for their visas. His aunt and uncle were apparently very strict. He never really explained what they did to him, but either it was very punitive or he was fearless and headstrong because he ran away. My grandpa was certainly headstrong. This was a man who only sold his bar after nearly losing his life in the process of protecting it. The bar he owned was in downtown Muskegon, a working class town on the east coast of Lake Michigan. The clientele at his bar was mostly black and apparently pretty rough. In the mid 1950s, the city wanted to buy this, his property as part of an improvement project. A parking garage, a mall, who knows? Anyway, he refused. One night, someone attacked him from behind with a razor blade, nearly cutting his carotid artery. My grandfather had seen the glint of metal, off, the glint of light off metal and had turned back around at the last second. This saved his life and allowed him to sub subdue the man with the help of his bouncer, Cadillac. Though Cadillac was six foot six and was often pictured in a pinstripe double-breasted suit, he was not the true enforcer when there was trouble. My grandpa Stanley, at five feet five inches, was the real muscle. After this attack, though, my grandpa was hospitalized for a long time. He understood this as a message and, at his wife's urging, finally sold the business. This ferocious independence would not have done well in a strict authoritarian household, so I'm not surprised that he wanted to run away. The fact that he had the chutzpah to actually leave when he was merely 12 is shocking. He traveled by train, riding beneath them. There was apparently a small ledge under the train that you could squeeze onto. You'd lie there, surrounded by the wheels thundering, the chunk of the train's pistons shaking deep in your chest, watching the ground whistle by beneath you and at your destination, wait for a chance to sneak away without being caught. My grandpa, one of thousands of soot-covered orphans wandering through the countryside of post-war Europe, traveled from Warsaw through Western Poland, Germany, and Belgium to Paris. That's 850 miles through what must have been a hellscape of cratered buildings, refugees, sorrow, and deprivation. I don't know how they fed themselves, where they slept, or how they communicated. In Paris, he ended up in an orphanage and was able to contact his parents. They put him in touch with a family member in the States who could sponsor him, a distant uncle that lived in Chicago. My grandpa claimed that he never changed his name during his travels. Maybe there was in fact a large community of Barus who were simply decimated in the war and the violent anti-Semitic pogroms that followed, a prelude to what would happen to scores of names during the Holocaust 25 years later. The documents that we have from the orphanage in Paris do spell his name Baru, but I've always thought that it is more likely that the name was changed. Perhaps Baru is a Francification of Baruch, 
a softening of the harsh guttural, guttural ending in the, of, of the Hebrew word for blessed. Maybe the name was a truncated version of something longer, more complicated and more clearly Ukrainian, something like Baruchkovsky. Maybe it was a common Ukrainian name, less clearly related to the final product, a name like Burstein. Possibly as he went from country to country, he changed it slightly, working to adjust it to new ears. In this scenario, he would have slowly squeezed it, twisted it and cut it until he made it to that orphanage in Paris and the ultimate touches were applied. Most likely, he didn't have any choice in the matter and these changes were simply made for him. The bris is a bizarre practice. The idea of throwing a party eight days after delivering a baby is honestly cruel. Buying food, setting up serving ware, sending out announcements, finding a moil, all on no sleep and maximum, maximum anxiety, it's absurd. Not only are you heaping this stress on in the fog of newborn parenthood, you're doing it so a group of friends and family can watch someone take a scalpel to your child's penis. You've become newly responsible for keeping a very small and remarkably helpless being alive. He's so dependent on you that when you take off his clothes, his red little body begins to shiver. Now you welcome all these people into your home. You have some bagels, smoked fish, fruit salad. You schmooze and make small talk. You haven't been outside of your house in eight days and now you're surrounded by people and talking about the weather. When the moil is ready, you call the group together and walk, in, walk into the operating theater, your living room. The operating table, a card table with a sky blue chucks laid atop one of the pillows from your bed is set up in the center of the room. The moil wears a surgical mask over his nose and mouth with his enormous frizzled beard pouring out from beneath. You all solemnly observe. We are gathered here today to stare at this boy's penis and pray that he is not disfigured for life. We will bear witness to the medical malpractice should it occur. Then the ceremony begins. You hand your son, your tiny helpless son to a loved one, someone you have honored with the role of Kavaterin. She takes your son into the room where your friends and family are gathered, waiting. The room is now silent. You see your mom's eyes glistening with tears. Your dad is sitting at the head of the operating table, a beaming smile on his face. As your son is placed before your father, he reaches out to comfort the restless little boy. He places a cloth dipped in red wine into your son's mouth and the boy soothes as he settles into one of the few things he knows to be true at this early stage, suckling. It's over quickly and the moil places your son into your arms. The feel of him in your arms is already familiar. Warmth, comfort, and joy fill your chest. As the moil prays and speaks your son's Hebrew name to the group, welcoming him officially and for the first time to the people you love most, it's hard not to swell with pride and feel the sharp barb of gathering tears in your throat. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And next we'll hear from poet Dana Lichty. Thank you, Elizabeth. I wear white. I chose a part-time job on Saturdays in a nursing home, expensive cells for ancient bedridden white-haired women run by the mother of the boy I was dating, John Finney captain of the football team. If you add vinegar to the water, the whites will not fall apart, Mrs. Finney told me. I poured some in, stood at the stove, flames high, licking around the sides of the biggest pot I had ever seen, water boiling fiercely. 20 bleached eggs were poaching in there a slotted spoon, my only weapon against the smell of hot vinegar. White nurse's shoes squeaking, uniform glistening. I climbed the staircase with a heavy tray. Each of the five bowls held two eggs plus wonder bread spread with margarine. I spoon fed the first five ghost ladies, 
mopped up the dribble on their chins, all the while cooing at them. I returned to the kitchen for the five other bowls. I fed all 10 of the dying twice that day. The second time, oatmeal. Changed diapers, cleaned bedpans, washed dishes. As my workday finally ended, John drove up in his Corvette, hugged his mother, who reported, she's good at this. John winked at me. I am now close to the age of the women I tended. Eat poached eggs or oatmeal whenever I want. John died in Vietnam. I remember him opening the car door for me. Inside his stingray, we kissed. Let's get something to eat, he proposed. You look hot and white. I helped Nana kill the chicken. We chased down one of the dorking roosters. Nana pulls him feet first from the fenced yard, holds tight. She shows me how to snap the neck. The bird churns the air, squawks, at last is silent and still. She uses her sharpened ax to chop off his head, carries boiling water in a pail down the steep stairs to the dirt floor cellar. Mason jars full of pickled peaches and strawberry jam line the walls. We dunk the rooster in his fiery bath, ignore the pungent stink, pluck the chicken until his naked shell pink self is fully visible. Then Nana wields a sharp knife and guts it. A snack for the pigs. Innards spill over her small hands, soil the wedding ring she wears no matter what. In the kitchen, we dredge in flour, wings, legs, breasts, neck, thighs. Fork them with care into a sea of grease spooned from the dinty more beef stew can at the back of the white enamel stove. He fries, spit fire hot, in the cast iron skillet Nana has used her whole married life. I have eaten the same meal nearly every Sunday of my entire life. The chicken with mashed potatoes, gravy, string beans, cherry pie, vanilla ice cream churned by hand. It is worship this chicken time with Nana who has pure love for me, rolls her eyes when her son chastises me for every goddamn little thing. She lives to 94, long enough to see me a wife and mother. Right after closing the coffin, her son hands me a small red velvet bag, thin gold band inside. Your grandmother wanted you to have this. Dad lies about that part. I know she never had such a thought. My cast iron, rooster killing, pure love grandma. I wear her ring every day, no matter what. And finally, two pieces of lemon meringue pie. Dad has to drive or he gets car sick. He's got to be the first one up, dressed before I'm fully awake. Damn it, I guess I'll go, but the town is a wreck. Why waste a morning? I decide not to answer and avoid one more argument on the way to visit his hometown, Luverne. At 90, he's a bad driver, but a surprisingly good tour guide. Tells jokes, the one about the priest and two ministers when we passed the Methodist church where all his family's funerals took place. Adds local color, like the time he and his brother Harold tipped over an outhouse on Halloween only to find out old Al Dinsmore was inside. Points to landmarks, including the high school still displaying trophies from his champion wrestling days. The house where he'd been born so fast 
the midwife couldn't get there. Baseball diamond, site of his no hitters, corner where his grandpa's hardware stood, tiles in the sidewalk spelling out, Lichty and Sons, all that's left. He doesn't say one nasty thing, smiles and laughs the whole morning, jovial in the way reserved for golf buddies. As his, at his request, we stop at Bully's Diner on Main Street. I haven't been here for 15 years, he says. Bully's is famous for pie. We eat dad's favorite lemon meringue, homemade pie, the yellow of daffodils, meringue, delicate brown swirls. After big fights, I used to make pie for him. Carefully measured one cup sugar, five eggs, two tablespoons butter, half a cup lemon juice, salt, water, cornstarch, bought the crust, beat whites, into tall peaks. Old Bully himself comes out and takes a photo with my phone, dad and me, arms draped around each other's shoulders, big grins. I photograph the two pieces of pie. Dad's almost gone, mine with a few bites taken, arranged in a long swath of Iowa sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And next we'll hear from Emil Cassavary, who will read an excerpt from her creative nonfiction essay. Hello, this is a section of cycling. This is definitely going to affect your fertility, the doctor says. She's wearing a classic white lab coat practical brown hair neatly trimmed to her shoulders. She sits casually on a wheeled stool. I look down at my bare feet, pale against the powder blue laminate floor. I know you're only 21, but you should still keep that in mind, she says, scratching something on her notepad. The fluorescent lights buzz overhead. Is there anything we can do about it now, I ask, my eyes still trained on my toes. My voice sounds small in the cramped, cold room. Not really, she says. She stands from the stool and heads for the door. I'd suggest as soon as you find someone, have kids as quickly as you can. My aunt Julie had a husband once. My mother refers to him as Ivan the Terrible. They never had any children and they divorced before I was born. Julie's voice is soft and fragile like the rest of her as if she is always on the brink of tears. She has wispy blonde hair, bony wrists, and a pale complexion. When I hug her, her skin feels soft and crepey, her midsection doughy. She has a cat named Penny. At some point, my Aunt Julie ran out of eggs. When exactly this happens is largely based on luck. Some women are born with two million eggs, others with a measly one million. But at 65, Julie's childbearing days are definitively over. After Ivan, Aunt Julie moved to the West Coast and never came back home to Alabama. She had a long, prosperous career as an attorney for the Port Authority of Portland. Decades in the gray, humid climate of Oregon have preserved her. She looks much younger than her 65 years. When I comment to my mother about Aunt Julie's youthful appearance, she says, I'd still be beautiful too if I'd never had kids. When I visit Julie, we drive along the Columbia Gorge in her electric blue Mini Cooper with the white racing stripe. A knobby hand on the wheel, she looks out over the staggering cliffs and sparkling water. I see myself in her profile, the broad, slightly upturned nose, the dimpled chin, sharp green eyes. I wonder if she ever tried if a baby or babies were lost. I wonder if she has regrets or if she relishes her solitude. I don't ask. In 2011, Alice Taylor Castleberry made me an aunt. Her dark hair spiraled into a cowlick on the very tip top of her pink head. 
I rubbed my cheek against the cowlick, cradled her tiny density in my arms and wept. Not long after, her sister arrived, Margot Elizabeth, a pink dark headed bundle with the most enchanting eyes I'd ever seen, a storm of gray and gold and green. While in their mother's womb, Alice and Margot began to grow the egg cells or oocytes that would ultimately, theoretically, become their babies decades later. After 20 weeks of gestation, a woman, Alice, Margot, me, Aunt Julie, will never create another egg. In fact, after that 20 week mark, those egg cells start to die by the millions. Before we even leave the womb, we are deteriorating. Potential grandbabies evaporate within their grandmother's womb. I find this fascinating. It's my favorite cocktail party fact, though it doesn't always land well with other people. And the constant decay doesn't end there, not in the least. At the moment of their birth, Margot and Alice each had between one and two million egg cells. In the years before puberty, around 10,000 egg cells die within them every month. I wake up to the sound of Margot's high-pitched staccato cry. It's the middle of the night. Her mother is out of town and my overworked brother has slept through her grainy distress on the baby monitor. Gummy-eyed with sleep, I climb from the guest bed and pad down the carpeted hallway to the nursery. The crying stops abruptly when I open the door. Ama, she says in a halted, stuffy voice, thick with relief. Ama up, Ama up, she hiccups. I lift her from the crib. Her velvet hair is matted to her neck with sweat, the exertion of a tantrum. I unzip her onesie and blow on her back. She sighs. I sit down in the rocking chair and she settles into my chest, still sniffling. I rub her back a few circles this way, then reversed, pat, 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 shh. Many years later, my brother will ask me what it actually feels like physically for a woman to want a child. He asks this not only because he is a man, but because he and his wife never went through that acute stage of wanting. Their first child came along a little too quickly, a little before they were ready. Married at 27, pregnant by 29. Primal, the only word that comes to me, seems feeble, but the feeling is not. The feeling comes from my abdomen, the same place that hurts desperately when you lose a person, that icy cold hole where grief lives. The reason people double over in movies when they get tragic news, an arm across the abdomen and they bend, collapsing into themselves. That's the place where the wanting comes from. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, very much. Um, next, we will hear from Darren Dahl, reading an excerpt from his novel In Progress. Thank you. The Hunter. You never want a customer to go home empty handed. Paps always made it a point to do our best to make sure they got what they came for. Some old schoolers might mock us for our methods. They say it's not real hunting since we rely on technology as much as we can to turn the odds in our favor. We set up caches of food in plastic 50 gallon barrels and mount a motion activated camera in a tree. We used to tempt the bears to visit with candy or stale donuts until the laws were changed. Now we're not allowed to use processed bait, no Milky Way or peanut butter. Pap was furious. He says that our family has hunted this land for generations, but he's had more than a few skirmishes with the sheriff, getting busted most, multiple times for hunting out of season. Now we're forced to use corn or overripe apples and peaches to grab the bear's attention. While our improvised compost bins shoot off plenty of stink, they aren't nearly as effective at luring the bears as the junk food was. That's where the high-tech gear comes into play. We're strategic about where we place the bait, usually right outside the protected government land where the bears are plentiful. Pap's still sore about that too. 
What gives them the right to take away our land and our right to make a living, he'll ask. It ain't American. Bears seem to know where they're safe. Since we can't always go get them in the protected areas, we do our best to encourage them to come out and visit us instead. They can't seem to help themselves with the lure of an easy meal. As soon as a bear goes in for a snack, the camera catches him in the act. Then, morning of a hunt, we'll drive out to see which sites had any recent visitors. That gives us a log of when a bear visited the area and hopefully enough of a scent to cut the dogs loose on its trail. That's when we go to work. We get all kinds of customers during the season. They come from all over. Some of them come year after year, a tradition. Pap Relish is making a big show inside our old timber lodge, sharing stories of hunts past, build up the anticipation about what's about to happen. This one customer, guy from Atlanta, laps it all up. He's mid forties, maybe 50, overweight and balding, milky skin, like shaking hands with a beach trout. Talks a lot about making money. He reminds me of Ned Beatty's character in Deliverance, so I come to think of him that way. He's so excited, he can barely touch his eggs and grits. Grease drips down his wrist from the piece of bacon he's waving around like a microphone, then chattering on about how he wants to feel something, something inside that he's lost living in the big city. Figure shooting a bear will make him feel manly again or something. Clearly went shopping to prepare for the event. His safety orange vest and puffy hat still out of the box crisp. Ned says he's hunted bear before. He's hoping to bag a trophy this time. Plans to mount the head in his office. I reckon my friend, the odds are in your favor, Pap tells him. We've been seeing tracks of a big one hanging around these parts, maybe three, 400 pounder. Let's just hope he's been hungry. The dogs will sniff him out. Ned's eyes light up at the possibilities. He mimics planting a rifle butt in his shoulder, aiming up into a tree, squeezing the finger. Pow, he mouths, and smiles, wipes the corner of the mouth, up mouth with his sleeve. It's almost as if he's salivating. Sun's coming up soon, I say to him, as the steam from my coffee tickles my beard. You ready to do this? Yes, sir, he says with a little too much verve. As he stands up, his belly catches the edge of the table, spilling shit everywhere. Sorry, guess I'm a little anxious. I realize I'm in for a long day. I start loading up the pickup truck. It's an old hoss of a Jeep with lifted tires with a red brick thick tread designed to grab mud and slick rock. I turn the key, get the heater going doing my best to serve my customer before rounding up the dogs from the yard. Spread out in the fashion of a military camp, each dog has its own barracks-like structure to guard and duck into to escape foul weather. It's a wasteland devoid of anything green. Everything's been trampled or shit on. Even the nose stinging wisp from my cigarette can't distract from the smell percolating from the soil. My family has been breeding hunting dogs for generations. Most of the time, they stand, lay around, noses twitching, eyes peeled for any action. They're thick-legged, floppy-eared, and brindled, meaty around the chest. Loud, too. That's their secret weapon, scaring the hell out of anything they come across. Year after year, my ancestors would select the strongest and smartest dogs, made them together with the hopes that their offspring would inherit those traits. I've heard stories that when my family moved to the region from Europe, they brought dogs with them to help hunt and guard the family from the perils of the wilderness. They called them bloodhounds, which was a term for any dog that hunted by smell. Others, such as Plots, took the name of the families who bred them. It's unclear what the original breed was, maybe a Mastiff, but they were valuable especially for a family intent on staking out a homestead in the untamed mountains. I whistle to grab the dog's attention. I make the rounds to grab their leads as I gather the pack for the hunt. I've selected Lady and Scout to keep a, keep a couple of the younger dogs, Dread and Rock in line. 
They've run before, but never faced off against a bear. They'll learn something today. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Get that novel done. Um, next, we'll hear from poet Nicole Farmer. And um, I know she will be reading at least one piece that's more like a prose poem, but she may be reading, additional, I'm not sure, pieces that are just poetry. And I shouldn't say that, Nicole. Maybe you want to just explain a little bit since you're reading more than one. Uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to start with um, a poem that's going to be appearing in the spring issue of the Great Smokies Review. And then I have a few other short poems uh, to follow. <clears throat> thank you. This first one is called Visiting My Child Who Has Become an Adult. There's no hot food or fresh cut flowers awaiting me. Just the warmth of your flesh and your sleepy smile and all the coronavirus rules we broke to indulge in this moment like no other. With my nose in your hair and that familiar smell of the oils and perfume only your head can make. And my heart misses a beat and the world stands still from its constant spinning. And I am content to be wherever you are standing in the marijuana haze drifting out the door of your apartment, which I know must be yours because of the moldy croissants in a plastic box, which you hastily threw out in your frantic cleaning to show me the beauty of the place you have designed and decorated with care to make a home for you and your sweetie. And all I can do is look at your long, delicate fingers, each like a butterfly wing, as you gesture for me to step inside. This next poem is called Bon Vivant. Three women padding in bare feet around the wood floors of a cheery home amidst the flat, flat, mud green wasteland of Louisiana lawns. Three generations, mother, daughter, and grandmother, split open wide with grief and joy, finding comfort in each other's laughter. Now floating through ancient cypress trees whose knobby knees kiss a blue crack of sky through winking Spanish moss eyelashes. Our drifting boat rocks, daring sleepy-eyed alligators to perform their favorite trick. French tourists seek conversation. Squeaking vacation RV wheels spin stuck in the swamp. Mud, crunching apples, salty olives. Mud, New Yorker crossword puzzle, peanut butter and marmalade sighs. A mockingbird pitches his song in oak branches, scratching puffy winking clouds. Wet underbelly wind caressing my neck the patriarch long gone, whispers of churning discontents in sublime contentment. Role reversal. My oldest daughter instructs me how to behave after my second vaccination. I consult her when making travel decisions. She is 26, I am 58. She talks to me in a tone of patient understanding. I want to tell her what a wild child I was in my 20s. She expounds on democracy now, which we both listen to. I want her to read Dickens, to laugh. She tells me to call her back so we can discuss the Middle East. I promise to read the book she has given me on the nature of relationships. She dreams of women being raped and being unable to help them. I dream of jumping so high that my head pops above pink clouds. Her middle name could be Caution, not Rose. I have no middle name, but I would like Contenta. She is the virus expert. I am an aging hippie chick. Her anger lights the room on fire. My feet wander out of doors with no shoes. And this last piece is um, a poem in progress that is just about the little and big ways that we all help each other every day. 
rescue. Screen door slams, a flash of red in the road as I approach. A giant black crow swoops in with a strategic peck at the neck. I'm running now, arms flailing, seeing one red wing bent, but not severed, pointing at the heavens like an accusing finger. Then a passing car almost mashes him flat. The gust of wind that follows the near miss blows him toward the yellow line. All is still, no movement. I have a dish towel now and I move in to scoop him up. He squawks in protest and I'm glad to know he's still alive and fighting. Setting him gently under the birch tree among the bluebells. I see the crow circling in for another dive bomb attempt at his breakfast. I scream my threats and charge him. Up to the tree limb, he flies to watch and wait, as all predators patiently do. My yard cardinal is still so stunned and vulnerable, I whisper to him to just lie still and rest. Words of kindness being a necessary bomb to his possible survival. And I flash on the time you rescued me from Louisiana jail cell after eight hours of waiting. My one phone call made to Grandma Amelia, only to hear her pause and then say, I'll tell your father. Making it clear she sure as hell wasn't going to come. Age 16, caught shoplifting, terrified, and too young to have asked you about your checkered past. When I heard your voice echo down the long cold corridor, I knew my nightmare was over. My love for you that day changed in a way that we never had to talk about. Looking down, I noticed the Cardinal has just hopped up and looked around at the, blight, at the bright blue sky. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and next is Janet Moore, our guest editor, who will introduce uh, the two editor cho editor's choice writers. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. It's just been a joy to work on this. Um, a year of living with COVID-19 restrictions has left us all yearning for connections with people and places that we love. That yearning is manifest in this issue of the Great Smokies Review, and you've just heard some of the beautiful words expressing that. At a time of limited travel, these writers transport us to California, the Atchafalaya Swamp, a grandmother's Iowa farm, the home of an adult child, and an ancient forest floor. They tempt us to taste a briny oyster and a ripe mango. In a mountain forest, we hear the sound of baying hounds, the crunch of underbrush, a glimpse of a fleeing bear, and the crack of a rifle. We witness a newborn sacred ritual. We feel the pressure of an unforgiving biological clock. We walk through an empty house and feel the sadness of a parent's death. Reading their work, we become part of each author's skillfully shared history. Among these many fine pieces were two works that stood out for me as examples of this sharing. Priscilla Frake's poem, COVID Wants to Give Me, and Carson Minow's short story, The Crack, are my editor's choice selections because they encapsulate the anxieties and yearnings of pandemic life that we are now all too familiar with. I will now turn things over to the writers to read from their wonderful work. First, we will hear from Carson and then we'll hear from Priscilla. Thanks, Janet. Carson? Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read excerpts from the second half of my short story called The Crack. Um, when I was little, I liked to be a backpack, my own personal Baba, not this other unwitting Baba I've co-opted into kinship used to wear me around like a backpack and we'd go hunting in the creek for newts. My bare feet would climb up his hips all the way to the top where the view was better and it was safe. I'd hang from his neck with my orangutan arms. I'm sure I was gangly and cloying even then, but my personal Baba didn't mind. And this one hasn't much to seem to either, only when he is really thinking. 
but even then he'll just think away. I'll wipe his countertops or roll his non-slip socks into oversized balls while he minds the deepest parts of himself. If I run out of helpfulness before he's finished thinking, I'll excuse myself home. Baba Pung and I met right after my parents died and my boyfriend disintegrated and my cat marched off into the wilderness to go pass away in privacy, maybe to spare me ineffectually a third trauma. I had gotten a job at the corner store, the same job I have now, selling loose cigarettes and packaged liquor and microwave burritos to the same people. Baba Pung had seen me all the way from the sidewalk. He'd had just a cane then, not the walker he uses now, the walker that is unattended in the bathroom where he is not. I don't know why, but when I looked, but when he looked at me through the window, I waved at him. A big wave, like he was someone I knew well and was glad to see. Maybe I waved like that because he had been looking at me as if he recognized me too. He'd motioned in a way that said he was excited to tell me something, this stranger in house shoes on the sidewalk. He'd pivoted from his trajectory and came rushing toward the store with a haste that took him straight through the plate glass window. The window had shattered into a million safety glass squares which showered down all around Baba Pung and then shimmered angelically on his feet and shoulders. Um, he just stood there looking at me and the two customers like we'd never seen someone walk through a plate glass window before. People came running to help, but Baba Pung insisted that he was fine. He tried to hand me a hundred dollar bill for the window, but I told him the owner was on the way and I was sure there was an insurance for this kind of thing. I was embarrassed. Kids stood around with ice cream dripping down their chins, gawking at the man who still had pieces of glass atop his shoulders. He waved them on. The owner came and asked me to walk Baba Pung home. And that's how we met in this life. In the other ones, I can't be sure. Baba Pung said it involved corn in one and ocean in another. Maybe we had been sailors together or brothers on a farm. Maybe he'd been my mom. Baba Pung has a daughter named Christine. I call the number next to her name on the yellowed piece of paper taped by the phone and tell her he's missing. She seems more concerned with who I am and why I'm in his house than where her father is, but I guess that's to be expected. I'm surprised that he's never mentioned me, but then again, I am not. She says if she doesn't hear back from me in an hour, she will call the police. It is only after I hang up that I realize she meant she'd call them on me. Baba Pung has nubby, tiny feet and square toes. They needed lotion a few months ago, so I borrowed a Nivea tin from work and just started doing it for him, moisturizing. I don't know why he didn't ask me to. It seemed a little Jesus-y Jesus to me, but it had to be done. His heels were cracking deeply and his house wasn't exactly clean. I didn't ask where Christine was, but in all the years I knew him, she never once walked through his door. My feet are not nubby, but my mother's were. She had Mexican feet, Aztec feet with Spanish arches, square and brown. Conquistador sailors had married the stubby-toed natives, or at least in body did. Traded guns and blankets and tea and sugar for them, blew their other husbands to bits so they could genetically infuse their toes and cheekbones with the future. Feet walked these women right out of their towns and temples. Feet walked the woman who didn't submit right off the plank. I imagine her feet didn't even kick in the waves, so certain was she that she'd return to get her revenge in some other way later. Mexican feet, Chicana feet, me. Feet walk you to the mailbox down the aisle to work, to the bathroom, toward or away from the wrong people. If you're lucky or unlucky, maybe they walk you to your death or to your soulmate or to the lab where you get the results to the video store where you meet the lady who gives you the cat that becomes your best friend until its feet walk it off into the woods to die without witness. Feet do every single part of living and get very little acknowledgement. Baba Pung's feet deserve lotion and wherever they have walked him to, they deserve to be warmed in these old house shoes or at least his non-slip socks. I shove a sock ball into my pocket and take off down the street toward the monstrous bougainvillea, which we read about in the paper yesterday. It bloomed unnaturally in the winter and is quite a sight, apparently. 
feet take us from weird places to even weirder places. And if they ever left any prints from where we came, they've been long paved over. There are no footprints like, clums, like crumbs in the forest to show us the way back. So we tell our stories about those places to try to make sense of the history and the people whose lives we've walked out of. Baba Pung and I have a shared heritage, a birthright to the same place, a place that is long gone. I am holding the paper bag of buns in one hand and his house shoes in the other. They are the same corduroy slippers that he ferried shards of glass back home on long ago. The same ones I'd banged out over the railing, praying that I wasn't sprinkling baby birds with safety glass before I said goodbye. I had felt on that day that I was invited back, so I've returned every day since. This is maybe the 2000th time I've returned and the first time he's ever not been here. Under the Bougainvillea bush, two children are standing on their tiptoes trying to catch a small bird that is hopping back and forth between the branches. The bird is humoring them, dipping from perch to perch, delighting them with the possibility of being just within their reach, knowing it could never be caught. This was love, it had to be. I'd half hoped Baba Pung would be there inspecting the papery blossoms. Down past the park is the creek and to the side of the creek, a drainage area where a big stone wall had been fortified with cinder blocks and rough cement. I don't know why my feet brought me here, but I assume it's because his bare nubs left psychic prints in the for me to follow in the sand. He is stuck deep in the darkness of the crack between the walls, wedged in tight on the far end. I can see his eyes in the dark, familiar as they had been through the window. Put your arms around my neck, I say, like a backpack. Thank you, Carson. Thanks. Our final reader is poet Priscilla Frick. Six o'clock news. The world is renaming itself. Rising bay, shrinking glacier, drowned archipelago. Meanwhile, I'm busy making stew, chopping carrots while there are carrots to chop, caramelizing onions, adding bay leaves and thyme as the news drones on with snatches of disaster. A new world, colony collapse disorder, umbilical wires tethering us to a failing grid, tropical diseases swarming into northern latitudes. I eat with the TV, then clear the table, scour the soup pot, put anxiety back in its narrow drawer. I silence the pundits with a click. Sandblast of wind, spring accelerating, forests at flashpoint, hundred year storms stacked at the coast, incoming drought or flood. I walk through the house, locking doors, securing windows. I set the alarm, then slip into the blackened acres of incandescent dreams. In the second poem, um, I need to tell you that DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, Men of Mental Disorders. Storm Tracker Guide to Resentment. Doppler radar indicates a large low pressure system is moving into the psyche. Atmospheric conditions favor the development of a downward spiral. A hostile cold front colliding with tropical moisture will likely form a passive aggressive squall line. The DSM has called for voluntary evacuation. This disturbance may produce baseball size grudges, take shelter immediately. If the system stalls, severe vexation is probable. Those in low spirits should move to higher ground. Hurricane force winds may vent their spleen over the viewing area. Avoid underpasses and misunderstandings. Never drive into standing water without knowing the depth of the grievance. And this last poem is the poem published in the Great Smokies Review. COVID wants to give me the plush spotted throat of a tiger lily 
and embroider my lungs with tiny roses in scarlet and burnt sienna. It wants to gild me with fever and dust my heart and kidneys with glittering spikes of glycoprotein. COVID wants to fashion me a headdress of invisible pearls that hang before me and scatter as I speak, flung to the crowd like Mardi Gras beads. It wants to make a cutwork of my guts, a frothy lace. Don't we all secretly long for attention? Don't we yearn to be dressed in our own extravagant distress? But I want to keep breathing. I creep around the edges of the grocery store, an anxious mouse in a gray cotton mask. As COVID keeps trying to pose me like a statue, vein me with cytokines, and inlay its ivory in all my cells. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla, and all of you. And thanks, everybody out there, for joining us. And we hope you'll come again when the Writers at Home series resumes in the fall. Hosted, as always, by Malaprops. So see you in September. Bye.